So it's trying to do a unified name service that's a little bit better implemented. And in fact, you can even use it like a uh, NFS file system where you can go into file system paths and look at remote file systems through the UNS interface. Now to the user, it's transparent. It's more the underlying software implementation that's different. And it is SGI specific. Okay, no other vendor is providing this or no other vendor has a name for anything like this. Uh, it's pr primarily a competition with Sun's NIS product. Okay. So in terms of the underlying layers, the application and the applic network and applications make the same sort of system calls. Get the password by name, get UID, things like that, get host by name, get the host entry. And then we have to ask some sort of either NIS client or some sort of resolver to figure out, map that into what I really need. So within NIS, YP bind would provide that, and then YP serve on the other side would go off to the NIS database and get the information. And in uh, name D or, or DNS type of environment, there's no real daemon running on the resolver, but we open up a service socket to name D and ask it, find the actual information that I need out of your database. So UNS was created to standardize the interface to all these various different networking services. Also to implement new networking protocols easier and to improve the network performance. And again, in this area, the network performance we're talking about is uh, database lookups for things like host names and passwords and stuff. Not necessarily how quickly my VI is going to work across the network, but how quickly my telnet gets there. Things of that sort. So UNS is basically a new daemon. I said before the uh, daemon name has changed now. We now have a new daemon called NSD. So this would replace NAMED or some of the other resolvers. And again, the application at the library level recognizes that NSD is there and then makes the call to NSD. And then NSD looks at the type of protocol and may go off to an NIS server for RPC protocol or it may go off to an NIS plus server with using secure RPC or a DNS protocol going off to a DNS server. And there's also something called LDAP, and I haven't been using that much, but that's a, a directory protocol. Do they list it down here? No. Nope. Think on the next page. So UNS was designed and implemented by SGI in 6.5. It does communicate with earlier releases of IRIX. So if my NIS service is running on an IRIX 5.3, my UNS can still talk to the 5.3 NIS and get information from it. But it's also supporting some of the newer pr protocols, this LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access pro Protocol. And it also uses the secure R RPC to get to NIS Plus type of network information service servers. Now, pre-IRIC 6.5 systems may communicate with UNS through the use of standard protocols. And also, any applications that were built prior to 6.5, when they're running on 6.5, would call that library routine, and the library routine would pick up the NIS or UNS paths, P particularly if you're, you're using DSOs that have picked that up. If you've hard-coded the get names and stuff like that, then it's not going to pick up the service. But in most cases, we are using DSOs and would pick that up right away. So UNS communicates with other vendor systems that support standard protocols such as NIS or DNS. At the implementation level, there are a couple of new libraries, uh, NSLOOKUP and NSLIST. And we have a file system called slash NS, which is almost like NFS. Now I can actually go into slash NS and find files of those remote machines. There is a system-wide cache for everything, and there's a cache miss daemon. Now, it's calling NSD the cache miss daemon, but that's just the network service daemon protocol. And then it's in implemented in the protocol libraries to, to detect the fact that we have UNS on this particular machine. So NS underscore lookup, any network API is going to call this NS lookup that then goes to get host by name. I'm sorry, the, the get host by name call is going to result with newer DSOs and calling this NS lookup that's then going to go off to the NSD to get the information. Okay, so starting at 6.5, the standard name service API routines, which once contained protocol code to communicate with name D and YP, are now going, uh, going to call this NS lookup and talk to the NSD daemon that's running on whatever server I'm pointing to. 
And we also have a name service file system. Uh, the name service daemon returns all answers here. Any data is presented in a historic file format, normal files. It supports XFS style extended attributes. It does support trusted IRIX MAC labels. So if I go off into a file system like slash ns slash domain slash name slash protocol, standard security is going to protect it. And they've got an example here where like doing slash ns slash csdsgi.com slash host by name slash dot files slash host. And that would be the database coming off of that particular NIS server or UNS type of server. So UNS does cache files. It's an extremely fast client-side lookup. A multi-reader, multi-writer on many things, but only root can do that. There's a single key value that we look for. The cache is a fixed size, and there's a special hash algorithm that's being used in there unique to this particular application. And memory is mapped into the application. It is using, it is pinning and mapping memory, mapping pages into memory. There's a separate cache file for each table maintained by NSD. And each cache entry has a timestamp allowing the application to define timeouts. And a lot of this information is managed by the NSAdmin command. So in this example, they went to slash var slash ns and found the cache, and here's all my cache files. So whenever I go by group, by host, by networks, by password, and for various protocols and services. And for password, it looks like they have a shadow by name as well. So that if, if that exists, then I don't have to have encrypted passwords in my uh, password by name and password by user ID uh, databases. Okay. So all that's in var ns, NS cache. Now, UNS Cache Miss Demon does all your name service lookups for the system. It's called by NS Lookup or NS List. It implements all the protocols to, to speak to whatever types of name servers you have out there. And then it stores the return data in a global cache. Now, this cache is not necessarily a memory cache. It's more of a disk cache in var NS that we were just looking at. So it returns all the output from that global uh, or from that remote server and puts it in slash NS. Uh, the N NSD daemon is restartable by NS admin. It's a non-blocking daemon. There's one daemon and it's non-blocking. It does not fork off children to handle anything. But by non-blocking, it means I can submit multiple requests to it at the same time. And it's replacing YP bind and YP serve daemons. And then there's this uh, configuration file, it's the NS switch, name service switch dot conf that controls whether I look at UNS first, DNS first, what's the order that I want to resolve my name. I could even specify go to ITSY host first, then NIS, then DNS, then UNS. I can specify what I want. And they've got an example here of an ITSY NS switch dot conf. Uh, we're saying that we're going to do it by file, which is an ITSY password, or go to NSS. If we're going for host, we're going to go to DNS before we go to NIS. Okay, so for each of these types of attributes, we can specify how do I want to resolve it. And if I change this configuration, I got to do a kill all hop to NSD so that it would reread this configuration file. And it's also used to build the slash NS file system for the, the name lookups and the databases that we have there. Uh, the NS daemon dynamically opens our protocol libraries within UNS, contains all the name service protocol code previously in the C libraries. So rather than being in the C libraries, it's actually within the daemon itself. And then the libraries are going to be resolved, listed in the order that nsswitch.conf does them. So for example, for the host files, we go to itsy host first, we go to DNS second, we go to NIS third. And uh, the, the protocol information is in var ns lib, and then depends upon the type of library that you're looking for. Each library has a small set of entry points like init, lookup, list, verify, things like that. So they've gone into var ns lib and shown all these different libraries, lib ns underscore, for the different types of uh, routines that we're commonly calling. So there's a whole bunch of library calls that are common out there. Now UNS and NIS can work together. 
uh, UNS changes to NIS, UN and NSD replaces YP bind, NSD replaces <coughs> YP serve. It's executing something called NIS serve library routines. Again, it's a full non-blocking implementation and resolve order specified in nsswitch.conf. And then all the databases on the server side have been moved now to var ns and then the domains. And it caches the server information. Uh, what else? That looks like all the same information. I don't see anything different on that page. We're just showing here, I guess, that NSD is unique. The resolver has been replaced there. But on the other side, on the server side, it's the standard DNS or NIS, whatever type of service provider you had out there. It's just a layer that's stuck in, in between here. So they're tracing a password lookup with UNS here. Somewhere in a program, we do a get password by name for somebody called Joe. We then end up calling NS look, or let's see, we'll go to, where's two? Two is where the uh, cache is actually in there. Maybe I should just read these. So two, the NS lookup first checks the UNS cache file, password dot by name. And again, that is going to be based upon uh, the resolution, the resolve information. But it's going to first check the cache file to see if it can find it there. If not, then it's going to check to see if the answer resides in the UNS file system. If not, then it's going to issue a request to the NSD daemon to locate the answer. NSD then is going to consult the nsswitch.com file to figure out what protocol order it should use to get the answer. In this case, it's got to check standard ITSI host files first and then consult NIS. No, I'm sorry, since we're getting passwords, it's going to go to ITSI password file and check for the user entry Joe. And then if not found, it's going to issue a request to the NS daemon, which provides the role of an NIS server. The NS daemon is going to issue a request to the NIS server library routines, which look up Joe in its database. Then the password record for Joe is returned back to the NSD daemon. And the NSD daemon saves the answer in the cache file that's in slash NS, depending upon what uh, key or what value I was looking for. And then the daemon returns success for failure to the NS lookup routine, and then the get PW name routine parses the answer from the appropriate file, uh, slash NS file system location. And that's about all for UNS. I have not used it at all, so I don't have any, uh, anything I can add to it, which I'm sure you're all glad of, right? <laughs> at this late date for Friday. NIF, NFS is the last piece. Now, the problem here is that NFS has become an integral part of our data centers. And the main reason for that was management of file systems to centralize the administration of these file systems. It's not necessarily for performance. So I could have 100 workstations all going to one NFS server, making it easier for me to back up their home directories, rather than having to go off to all the individual workstations and do backups and having tapes going across networks and all that sort of stuff. So it's primarily for homogenizing our environment and simplicity of administration and backups and reliability of our file systems. Now, I normally do not advise people to do production I.O. in NFS file systems, like Gaussian and Nastran and things like that. You generally design a production file system on your local compute server to do that sort of stuff. And then when you're done, you're either going to move it with NFS to home directories or move it to a slash archive which typically has NFS protocol, but then bulk data service on top of it. And bulk data service is designed for large sequential I.O., whereas home is lots of little I.O. types of behaviors. And everyone's hooking everything together with NFS these days, and, and you end up getting all kinds of problems, because now you're moving all kinds of stuff across the networks. Uh, you also have the issue of uh, reliability if the the other server goes down, you can't get to its file systems, and you may do retries, things of that sort. But it's basically creating a file system across the network. And it was a Sun implementation. NFS has been implemented on Unix machines, but it's available on VAX, DOS, and Windows NT. And it's using the uh, user datagram protocol, UDP protocol, to communicate between client and server. Uh, that's more reliable and faster than it was with the uh, TCP protocol. 
Because UDP is connectionless and it's low network overhead, it's immune, relatively immune to problems associated with one side going down or coming back up. Uh, I've got some blanks in here, but it's just trying to say that uh, uh, using the path names there before, we could got into the remote file system by specifying the path name on a different machine, getting to a different file. Now the layers that NFS uses are similar to what we saw with DNS written by uh, Mountain View or Silicon Valley types of developers. So we've got NFS on top and there's NFS daemons. There's an NFS daemon, there's a BIO daemon, that sort of thing. Then underneath are the layers we've talked about before, XRD for data representation and presentation layer, the remote procedure call, the UDP layer, the IP layer, and then the network interface. And it doesn't specify anything here unique. Again, it's still dependent upon external data representation and Sun Microsystems implementation. Okay. Now NFS is, is a stateless system. The server does not have to remember from one transaction to the next what it's done so far. So this is similar to a web browser that's kind of stateless. If the client is failing, the server does not need to know, nor does it care. If the server is failing, the client need only retry the request until the server responds. The client does not know, the client does not need to know that the server has failed. It's just going to do a retry and eventually give up. There's a little bit down here. If a fa the server fails, clients need to only continue to attempt complete NFS operations until the network gets fixed, at which time the NFS operations will be honored normally. Clients will therefore either be suspended until the server comes back, that's hard mounted file systems, or you're going to get timeout after a few t attempts, and that's a soft mounted file system. And that's all determined in your FS tab, for example, when you mount a remote file system, whether I want to mount it hard or soft. And they've got an example here of a diskless file system. There's no home directory or disk there. So all required software, including the OS, is provided through a remote NFS file system. I myself hate diskless workstations because I have to beat up everybody on that network to get what I'm trying to get across, like my Netscape stuff. So we've got an NFS configuration here where the NFS client, the user file requests, we make a system call to the kernel and remember the vNode specified whether it was a local or remote. If it was a remote file system, we invoke the NFS layer. And then the NFS layer talks to the NFS layer on the server. And on the server, we've got a vNode that points to the actual file. But as far as the user's concerned, it's just a normal read and write. And then there's also the RPC and XDR layers. Again, they're going to be talking to each other. Same sort of story that we just saw. So the RPC is for remote procedure call. Provides a standard way for programs running on different OSs to invoke procedures on a different system. And we can pass arguments and return results in that re remote procedure call. Okay. Anyway, now you can look at the rest of your own. So this is a client server environment. The NFS client is what I'm working on, and then I have somewhere else an NFS server that's serving off of me. Are you in an NFS environment in this building? Yeah. yeah. So I do a PWD to figure out where I am. I'm going to go up one, and then I can see everybody else that happens to be on my particular server, because we're all in the same file system. So all it takes is any one of these people to abuse this particular NFS server and everybody's going to complain. It looks like it's Cheetah 1 that's your NFS server, at least for this workstation. So everybody that's on Cheetah 1 with their home directories, if I move 9 gigabyte of data into my home, everybody else is going to feel that. There's no segregation on this particular NFS server. In my uh, data center, I go up one, I've only got two other people on my NFS server. So I've only got two people that get mad at me rather than 20 or 30. 
if they know who's, who's causing the problem. They often don't because they don't have server-side information in terms of who's making demands there. But they can usually do DFs or disk usage or something like that to find out who the big disk hogs are, those sorts of things. So a machine that provides resources to the network is an NFS server. It's where all of my files sit. Any node can be an NFS server, and it could be a client and a server at the same time. I could be a client getting data off of another server and still be serving data to another machine as well. Now we have several demons involved here. Mount D reads the it's the X tab to determine which file systems are available to which machines, and it provides information to the clients about file systems mounted by the it's the RM tab, which can be viewed using the show mount command. And the uh, client's NFS mount request talks to the server's mount daemon to check access permission of the client, and there's this it's the exports file that basically gives some of this permission and returns a pointer to the file system if permission was granted. Then we have the NFS daemon and it's processing the client access requests once the file system directory has been mounted. By default, there are four NFS daemons running, and traditionally they're running real time, but now they're running in timeshare. But it could be configured based upon the load expected on an individual server. If I have a lot of file requests going on, if I have a lot of file system manipulation, then I may want more NFS daemons. After an NFS mount completes, access to that mount point and below goes through the pointer to the NFS server's NFS daemon using remote procedure calls. There's also this port map or RPC bind program that converts the RPC program numbers into protocol port numbers, and it must be running in order for RPC calls, which NFS uses. There's also a PC NFS daemon. We were talking briefly about that. I do have the ability of mounting NFS PC-based clients. So I could even pop up a uh, soft Windows, mount a DOS disk into it, and mount that thing onto my Unix file system. So the PC NFS daemon is used for PC file systems. On the client side, we have two daemons, BIOD. The optional client daemon handles the read ahead and write behind requests does some bufferings, things like that. And then BI, BIO3D handles the NFS client read and write behind requests using NFS version 3 rather than the older version 2. And NFS version 3 has performance advantages to us. Okay. And uh, one of the things it did was up transfer sizes, for example. When NFS version 3 is moving things around, 32K byte has been the default uh, transmission size, MTU size. So it's the exports file determines attributes. So in this it's sample it's the exports file, we have three file systems, lib, user2, and user source. Uh, lib has been set up as read-write for Bonnie and Clyde, read-only for user1, read-only for source, but Larry, Moe, and Curly can access it. And again, Mount D and NFSD have to be running as well to be able to do the lookup on the permissions. So I may have a file system, I may have a, uh, a NFS server that I don't want most of the file systems uh, showing or accessible, and I can shut them off and make them uh, uh, unaccessible, for example, not exported at all. Now to display your uh, export status, the show mount shows all remote, remote NFS mounts. So in this example, it said uname-a, we're on flurry, did a show mount-e, and the file systems get, that can be exported off of flurry were user people, temp, and crash. Now why they exported slash crash, I don't know, but that's one of the file systems they're exporting. And then show mount-d is just showing the file system directories, and show mount-a is giving me everything, the host name and the paths. So to become an NFS server, you first of all have to configure ITSI exports to say which file system can I export. You also have to make sure that NFS software is loaded. So they did a show prods NFS to see that that was there. Did a check config to turn on NFS. And then using the network command ITSI inetd slash network start, they then started NFS. Uh, then the uh, NFS server daemons were automatically started. The NFSD and the RPC bind daemons automatically started by inetd slash network. 
And the NFS mount D daemon is started when a mount request is received. It terminates after the successful mount. It's not there all the time. To become a client, I simply have to have the NFS software loaded. I have to do a check config NFS on. And then when I start my NFS, start my network, NFS will start. And the BIO daemon is going to start up. And in this example, then, they did a show mount afterwards to say, what can I export? Then they chose the local directory where the remote file system or directory structure will be made accessible. If necessary, they do a make dir. For example, on my systems under ITSY host, we may do a make dir for all the hosts that we're going to mount. To automate the mounting of these file systems, configure ITSY FS tab. That is the preferred way, performance-wise, to take care of mounts. If you're mounting on the fly all the time, you're going to fragment your cache. What you want to try to do is mount anything that you're consistently using on boot. That way, they're all going to have all the mount entries together in the same place, and you won't be fragmenting cache. So mount and unmount commands can, can be used to manually do things, but again, that can fragment your cache. So they did a mount or DF to show the status of the current mounts. So they did a mount here and showed Lupo export IRIX opt1 was mounted on slash opt1. It's a NFS version 2. When I'm reading and writing data, it's 7680 bytes. It's a read-write. It's in the background. I can break interrupts out of it. And there, I'm not sure what the dev equals. Okay. And then when they did the DF, you can also see it with a host name colon and then the path name that you have on your system and what it's mounted locally as. And remember, buff view also shows NFS traffic. Now you have hard and soft mounts when you're mounting these file systems. Hard mounts. An unsuccessful mount request, the client will retry the mount until the server responds. If I get an unsuccessful attempt to access files from a hard mounted file system, there's a specified number of retransmissions I'm going to attempt again, and then I get this message, server not responding. But it will continue to retry. What was that? And then soft NFS mounts, if I get an unsuccessful mount request, I'm going to retry up to a specified number of times and quit. And if I try to get to a file that's an unsuccessful attempt to get to the file on a soft mounted system, I retry a specified number of retransmissions and then I get a connection timed out instead of a server not responding. And talk about a dead workstation when your home directory server is not responding, right? So in standard NFS implement, implementation, we have to use a layer to be able to handle user IDs and group IDs. The assumption is made that users have the same UID and group IDs on all machines that are cross-mounted. That's why we get into flat UIDs, where everything in the same domain has the same uh, configuration. And that's the advantage of NIS, is to get them all consistent. And traditional NFS environments, we're using NIS, formerly called Yellow Pages, to do this lookup. <coughs> now, NFS, we do have locking mechanisms. There's something called LockD, such that I can lock a file while I'm manipulating I.O. on it. So, so files, file CNTL can lock that file so that nobody else can touch it. And again, it's an advisory lock. Okay, so to use the locking service, applications have to make the calls to do their locking. We've got FCNTL, FLOCK, and LOCKF in the library area. And this is a problem with some of the newer applications being implemented, is being able to control those locks better and not sitting there waiting on an NFS lock. One last piece that usually comes along with NFS, now this, this is part of NFS, but is used in many different ways. It's called CacheFS. Now, CacheFS to me is like LD Cache. It's a way of caching a remote file system locally. If I keep reusing the data, I don't want to have to go across the network to get it. CacheFS will hold it locally for me. And CacheFS can hold it both in memory or on the local disk file system. And there's a new command called CFS Admin. I don't know if it mentions it here, but CFS Admin is used to configure this. I know one site, uh, McDonnell Douglas, that uses it on local file systems to cache things. 
Okay, so they're using it like an LD cache type of concept. So cache FS was introduced in IRIX 5.3. It's typically used on NFS clients with local disk space. And you've got to have the disk space because it's going to do its caching on its local file system. So with cache FS, frequently used data from a remote system or something like a CD-ROM can be stored on the local disk directly accessible to the client. Now, typical environments we have, we're not using cache FS that much. And the last piece I have now was bulk data service. I think this should be the last page. Oh, a few more pages here. BDS is available on Unicos and IRIX. It's part of the Array Services software. It is licensed and priced separately. It is appropriate in cluster environments. I'll generate my data in slash temp and then copy it to slash archive or use RCP or something like that typically. Rather than using RCP and breaking it up into lots of little 4K byte chunks, I can go to like 64K byte chunks and simply bypass file system buffer cache and get it straight off to the NFS server that the data is being served on. So a lot of these sites will cluster a whole bunch of machines together, generate the data on the machines, and then dump it off onto slash archive that's NFS mounted and then has BDS running on top of it. They'll typically also run data migration on that slash archive file system so that it is designed for large files. They're being written into it sequentially. That's what the copy is doing. When I copy from one file system to another, that's a sequential copy. So it's an extension to NFS. It is SGI specific. And we implemented it in Unicos after the merger. You have to have 6.2 or later. It's designed for large file transfers over gigabit networks. It's not for home directories where you're doing hello moms. It accelerates the standard NFS performance. It's 10 to 20 times faster than NFS2. And it's five times faster than NFS3. But again, only for large transfers. If I'm writing hello mom, you're not going to see the performance difference. And it's using its own protocol called XBDS. The greater performance achieved using TCP protocol instead of UDP because we're moving large amounts of data. Also, larger I.O. blocks are used, and we use direct I.O., so we're bypassing file system buffer cache. There's no sense in pushing it through cache if we're not going to reuse the data. And that's the whole purpose of bulk data service. It's known as BDS Pro. It's designed to exploit XFS rates, and the application may need tuning for comparable performance from XFS. But again, the general way is to generate the data doing lots of little I.O. in a local file system and then simply move it or copy it to a BDS file system. So it'd have to be the copy command and stuff that's going to take advantage of it. You normally don't do production I.O. over a BDS file system. So they're giving some of the uh, speed differences here comparing NFS over UDP versus uh, TCP, that sort of thing. So here's an example. I'm sitting on my client. I have to get some data. My NFS server host says, oh, I've got to go get it. So the server kernel has to invoke with this BDS protocol. It's going to have to invoke NFS code, TCP code, or XFS code, depending upon what it's doing. So in this case, the client sends off my NFS request. I get the NFS socket, but then I invoke the BDS control and BDS data into my kernel. And some of it's coming out of my XFS file system, but I'm doing that direct I.O., not through cache. And then I can read the data across through my control socket and data socket that I'd set up through the BDS interface. And again, it's upping the transfer size and bypassing file system buffer cache. And that's where its performance advantages come into play for large requests, but not useful in small requests. And the layers are essentially the same. It's just that the protocols on the top three layers are now what are called XBDS that then talks to the TCP protocol layer rather than UDP for performance advantages. And then the layers underneath are still the same. And by the way, to get advantage from BDS, the file system underneath has to be performing well enough. If I've got a poor file system underneath, the general recommendation is design the XFS file system twice the bandwidth you need for BDS. Okay. 
And again, BDS uses big block remote I.O., no fixed block sizes, and then direct I.O. is used to access local to the server bypassing cache. The last piece we have is NFS auto mounting, automatic mounting. The older version was called auto mount. Auto FS was introduced in 6.2, and this is designed to dynamically mount remote file systems when referenced. And this is the thing in Unicos that can tend to fragment your cache because you're running auto mounter or auto FS instead. Any user can cause a mount. So I CD into a file system, and I have to know that the, the directory may be empty, and I have to know the directory underneath that I want to mount to be able to CD into it. That can be fun. But any user can cause the mount. Super user privilege is not needed. The file system is automatically unmounted after a certain time interval. We don't read it's the FS tab for it. And again, it, FS tab is the better place to put things for things that you need mounted all the time. This is just for that temporary person that's got to get something off that system. It's going to use maps for mounting the information, and auto mount and F, F, auto FS cannot both be used. It's one or the other. So the kernel's virtual file system is called AutoFS. It supports automatic mounting of remote systems. It runs on the client only. Server doesn't have to worry about it. And requires creation of map files since its EFS tab is not used. The AutoFS command is what's used to install those maps. And AutoFS will detect user access at specified mount points, notifying this AutoFS daemon that it's got to do a mount. It also allows addition and deletion of mount points without a reboot. I don't have to reboot to pick up FS tab changes. Okay. Once the file system is mounted, auto FS daemon is not required to access the file system anymore. That's just to do the mount. And it's spelled wrong here, but auto FSD automatically unmounts after there's no activity. And if I have auto FS or mount FS in my check config, the network script is going to automatically start it up. So the last page here is just showing where I'm sitting here on a client and I CD into a directory. My server is a slash archive server. I've got source, previous, current, and next. And they may exist under here under source, but it's auto FSD that's actually going to do the mount. So a user on the client attempts to access the directory having the path slash source slash new. The AutoFS detects that it's accessed the, the trigger slash source. So AutoFS notifies the daemon that the trigger source has been accessed. AutoFSD then consults the maps to locate the file system. It then searches the master map for slash source. Once found, the, the location of the direct map is provided. And the direct map is sitting here in ITSI auto source, for example. So we're going to do this uh, AutoFS locates the direct map. The entry for new provides the system name and the directory structure, which needs to be mounted. It then issues the mount request, and then assuming the client's permitted to mount it, the mount is completed, and the user then is ac granted access. Okay. Anyway, I think that's all there is, right? Oh, one more page. And this is going through the same thing, isn't it? What's the difference? Oh, what happened? Oh, I see. Once I hit next, it stays on the same slide. So I'm done. I appreciate your attention for the uh, three days. Feel free to send me email if there are any questions on anything, particularly in the uh, tuning area. Not so much in the network areas, but feel free to send me the questions if you have any. And with that, have a good weekend and deer hunting season or whatever you have. I do accept donations of uh, venison. But <laughs> my family comes from Spooner, Wisconsin, but since my dad stopped hunting and moved to Arkansas, I don't get the venison anymore. And I have